Good morning. I'm Jane Chu, the new chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the 182nd meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. I want to welcome everyone this morning, council members, NEA staff, colleagues here in person, everybody watching online at arts.gov, and so, and for, so the record, for the record, the council, the council members, members are, are present, present here are violinist and educator Aaron Dorkin from Ypsilanti, Michigan, philanthropic professional Deepa Gupta from Chicago, Illinois, attorney, musician, and former member of Congress Paul Hodes from Concord, New Hampshire, arts consultant Joan Israelite from Kansas City, Missouri, Urban Planning and Community Policy Specialist Maria Rosario Jackson from Los Angeles, California, Music Professor and Arts Administrator Emil Kong from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Our Arts Administrator Maria Lopez de Leon from San Antonio, Texas, Artist and Community Organizer Rick Lowe from Houston, Texas, Jazz Musician, Composer and Band Leader from Irvin Mayfield from New Orleans, Louisiana, Visual artist Barbara Ernst Prey from Oyster Bay, New York. Dancer, choreographer, and teacher Ronnie Ramaswamy from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And museum director Olga Viso, also from Minneapolis, Minnesota. <coughs> Before we begin the business at hand, I wanted to take a moment and say what an honor it is to be able to address you today as the chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. Over the past few days, I've already seen the incredible dedication and the passion that the people of this agency bring to their work. This nation is so full. Maria will invite our Deputy Chairman for Programs and Partnerships, Patrice Walker-Powell, to take us through uh, the section of the meeting for programs. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Uh, those of you who know this section, I'll ask you to bear with me. It runs about six or seven mi minutes. We will proceed to the application review and guidelines review sections of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The Council will be voting by ballot today on more than 92 award recommendations totaling nearly $8.8 .8 million in two funding areas. First, leadership initiatives and second, literature fellowship translation projects. The funding recommendations are found behind the corresponding tabs in your Council materials. Please find your ballots in the folders at, at your place at the table. Council members joining us via teleconference have been instructed to email their votes to Kim Jefferson in these two immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. In order for your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council member affiliations have been recorded in the council book and on your ballot, and each member has been provided with an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Before voting, council members should review the list of recommendations and rejections and add to the list provided in your folders any affiliations that may be missing. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. After brief summaries of the two funding areas, council members will have the opportunity to ask questions and or discuss the recommendations before voting by ballot. After you have completed your ballot, staff will collect your folders and tally the votes. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under the leadership and fellowship tabs in your council book? Is there a second? Thank you. Now I will summarize the two funding areas on which you will be voting, pause for any comment or questions from council members, and then ask you to mark your ballots for each category. Leadership initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national, and fieldwide significance. At this meeting, the Council is requested to approve funding for 72 projects in five arts disciplines or fields, totaling more than $8.5 million. 
support is requested for two arts education initiatives, Shakespeare for a New Generation and Turnaround Arts. Next, the Mayor's Institute on City Design and 66 Our Town Grant Recommendations. One project in international activity, the Southern Exposure, Performing Arts of Latin America initiative, which allows U.S. arts organizations to present contemporary and traditional dance, music, and theater from Latin America to communities across the United States. An initiative that will serve the museum field through the development and distribution of a public publication to document the work of the 2014 Heritage Health Index Report and a national service and a national services initiative that will support research information and professional development services for the state arts agencies, the six regional arts organizations in cooperation with the Arts Endowment State Regional Arts Education <clears throat> Folk and Traditional Arts Program. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. On to literature fellowships translation projects which support translations of poetry, prose, and drama from other languages into English. This year, 20 grants totaling $300,000 are recommended. The proposed projects will support the translation of languages in 16 countries, ranging from Italian and French to Zapotec and Yiddish. Are there any questions or comments from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. For your information, there are no award updates at this meeting. Thank you. We will move to the guidelines review portion of the agenda at this meeting, but beforehand, I have a note to have a motion to approve the minutes of the March Council meeting. Thank you. All in favor say aye. aye. Thank you. Now back to the guidelines review portion. The Council is asked to consider three sets of guidelines. First, research. Artworks for 2015, literature fellowships, translation projects for 2016, and our town guidelines for 2015. I now turn to Jillian Miller, our Director of Office of Guidelines and Panel Operations, who will summarize the guidelines up for a vote at this meeting. Jillian. Thanks, Patrice. Good morning. At this meeting, you're reviewing three sets of guidelines, all of which contain updates to existing categories. Your first set of guidelines is for research artwork. These are for grants for research projects on the value and impact of the arts. And there are a couple of changes to these guidelines. We've revised the number of grants that we expect to make from 25 to 20 so we can more fully accommodate applicant requests. We've also added an eligibility criterion that would require organizations to have three consecutive years of operating history at the time of application. Your next set of guidelines is for literature fellowship translation projects. These guidelines describe the agency's support for fellowships to publish translators, for projects to translate prose, poetry, or drama from other languages into English. And your third and last set of guidelines is for our town. These are for creative placemaking projects that contribute to the livability of communities and place the arts at their core. And there are a few changes to highlight for you here. After four years of funding arts engagement, cultural planning, and design projects, and in response to requests from the field, we've created a new pilot area for our town to build and disseminate creative placemaking knowledge more broadly. We'll fund up to five projects with grants ranging from $25,000 to $100,000. For the arts engagement, cultural planning, and design projects, where it's appropriate, We've added language to let applicants know that their Our Town projects should demonstrate how they align with other federal placemaking programs and policies. And finally, if an applicant received an Our Town grant last year, they may apply again to Our Town this year. Previously, they were ineligible. Thank you, Jillian. Are there any comments or questions from the council lead members? If not, may I have a motion to approve the guidelines? Second. 
All in favor, please say aye. Any objections? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you, Patrice, and thank you, Jillian. Uh, now I'd like to ask our senior deputy chairman, Joan Shigakawa, to walk us through agency updates from the past few months. Joan? Okay. Thank you, Jane. So before we begin, I'd like to ask our staff to please join me once again in welcoming our new chairman of the NEA, Jane Chu. Yes. <laughs> so, okay, not only is this our first council meeting with Jane as our chairman, but it's also our first council meeting in the Constitution Center. And for those of you watching us on the webcast, the NEA moved into our new home on May 5th. Our new location is at 7th and D Street Southwest. We're approximately eight blocks from the United States Capitol, very close to the Hirshhorn and the National Air and Space Museum. So come visit us. Uh, we are thrilled with our new space which is as beautiful as an art agency to serve. I'd like to thank everyone for their patience, enthusiasm, and just plain hard work during the transition process. You should have seen the halls of the old post office building as people went through 35 years of their lives here and were told that they were going to bring three filing crates and everything else had to go to archives or out. Uh, so, and especially I need to thank Kathy Daum, who is our Director of Administrative Services, and Winona Varnon, our Deputy Chairman of Management and Budget. So no one worked harder than these two in making this happen, and we're all very grateful to them for handling the many challenges that have come up along the way. We could fill a whole meeting with describing those, but anyway, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Winona. We have a big hand for Winona. I am here to tell you, without those two, we would not be here today. So we're going to move on to updates from our Office of Research and Analysis. Earlier this month, we hosted a two-day symposium to explore how and why do we measure public involvement in the arts. The event took place here in Washington and was co-hosted by the United Kingdom's Arts and Humanities Research Council's Cultural Value Project. This marked our first formal research collaboration across international lines, which is very, very, we're very, very excited about. We were joined by researchers from the United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, uh, all of whom had differing perspectives and really sparked new approaches for us in answering some very public, puzzling questions. So some of the questions were, for instance, how can survey questions capture the value of a cultural heritage? Or how can we measure a person's motivations for participating in the arts? Or their, their motivation for not participating in the arts? So it was fascinating to hear about all that goes into creating a cultural survey, especially in light of our very own survey of public participation in the arts which will be released later this summer. So our Director of Research and Analysis, Sunil Iyengar, will be telling you more about the SPPA later this morning. Um, we also have another exciting research event coming up that, I'll t uh, that I'd like to tell you about. So Sunil and Bill O'Brien, our Senior Advisor for Program Innovation, have helped organize a conference at the Santa Fe Institute called the Nature of Creativity in the Brain, which will take place in early July. The event will continue the wonderful conversations we have generated during our webinars on neuroscience and creativity, which were hosted by the NEA Interagency Task Force 
on the arts and human development. This conference will bring leaders from the field together in one room, offering an incredible opportunity for dialogue and discussion. We'll be joined by researchers from such institutions as Johns Hopkins, UCLA, and the National Research Council, which, as you know, has the National Academy of Science and the National Institute of Medicine, all of whom are actively looking for ways to mine new knowledge at the intersections, listen to these intersections, cognitive psychology, neurobiology, neurotechnology, learning, and the arts. So working with such esteemed thinkers is helping put the NEA at the forefront of brain research, a position that may have once seemed unlikely, but I'm proud to say it's becoming increasingly well established. The conference promises to give us a comprehensive look at creativity within this growing field of study and where it might be headed in the future. And it puts us into the bigger conversation, the Obama Brain Initiative. We'll be recapping these events in our, on our ArtsWorks blog. It'll be on our Facebook page. So please make sure you check those out in the coming months. Uh, and now I'm going to go through a couple of other agency initiatives. As many of you know, we are in the midst of our fifth summer of Blue Star Museum. We had a fantastic kickoff at the San Antonio Museum of Art in May where we were joined by our council member, Maria de Leon, uh, and a number of military families. Many of you have seen the photos on the Arts Work blog. And of course, we were joined by our partners from Blue Star Families and the Department of Defense. It's really great to see a high-ranking military official up there with all their ribbons at the Museum of Art cheering the military families on to participate in museum going all summer long. So although it's only June, this already is our strongest summer yet, with over 2,000 museums participating across the country. General Martin Dempsey, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the highest ranking military officer in the nation, sent participating museums a letter of thanks this week. He noted that our program, and I quote, not only enhances the morale of our troops, it promotes the understanding and sharing of culture while enhancing perceptual and cognitive skills. You can't ask for much more than that from a program. So this is very true, and I'm endlessly proud that Blue Star Museums has provided museums with such a positive way to recognize and support our service members. In April, we hosted the finals of our Poetry Out Loud competition here in Washington. Anita Norman, a junior at Arlington High School in Tennessee, was named the new Poetry Out Loud national champion. And she received a $20,000 award in, in addition to $500 toward new poetry books for her school. 29 viewing parties were organized across the nation to watch our live webcast, which in total was viewed by almost 1,500 people. It was an impressive showing for an impressive group of young people. And I'd like to thank everyone in this room, and there are a lot of you, who helped to organize this big event. So thank you all. And uh, it's, it's, you know, it, it, this is an event which, which is worked on all across the agencies, states and locals, all the disciplines. Everyone pitches in. So that's it for the agency updates. Um, before we move on to our presentations, I want to take a moment to acknowledge all of the representatives from the service organizations who have traveled from near and far to be with us this morning. So I'm going to ask each of you who is here representing a service organization to please stand and be recognized. I see you, uh, the front row, the back row. Hi, Mario. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming. So now we're going to move on to our presentations. Earlier this morning, I mentioned that the full 2012 SPPA report will be released this summer. 
Conducted in partnership with the United States Census Bureau, the SPPA is the country's largest survey of arts, participation, and trends, and as such is an invaluable tool engaging the role that arts play in Americans' daily lives. So a preliminary highlights report was released in September, which sparked a lively discussion, which many of you participated in, about changes in the various forms of arts participation and what they, uh, what they might mean for our future. So now I'd like to ask Sunil Iyengar to please come up and tell us more about the SPPA and our future. Thank you, Joan. Good morning, everyone. So as Joan indicated, I'm here to preview findings from a comprehensive report we'll be releasing later this year about how Americans participate in the arts. This is coming from the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts, or the SPPA, so you'll hear that acronym a few times. Um, let's get the page on there. I think I... Great, thank you. All right. So. Um, the NEA began making a serious commitment to survey research on arts participation as far back as 1982, when the SPPA first was introduced to the public. Uh, since then, our office has issued a steady stream of research reports, brochures, and other publications about how many adults partake of arts activities, what kinds of activities, what kinds of adults for that matter, and how does that participation track with other leisure behavior. In recent years, we've made it a point to release the raw data and data tools for the surveys as speedily as possible, even as we completed our own in-depth analysis. For the 2008 survey, for example, we invited researchers to critique our assessment of the data. We asked them to prepare topical monographs to encourage a broad range of perspectives on the data we'd called, and to stimulate greater public dialogue about the findings and what they meant. The SPPA is a large household survey. It collects data from roughly 18,000 adults. In 2012, we more than doubled the sample size to about 37,000, and it represents individuals in virtually every U.S. demographic group and census region. U.S. Census Bureau conducts the survey, in fact, as part of a supplement to the current population survey. That's the survey you hear from which you hear uh, uh, quarterly employment numbers uh, from the, reported in the press, uh, with which it's been associated since 2002. But the survey was also fielded by the Census Bureau in these other years as well. An important point is that the questions are predominantly set up to ask adults about their participation in arts activities about a 12 month, over a 12-month period. In general, it does not ask about attitudes toward the arts, only behaviors. As people who've been tracking the study know, uh, in 2008, there was a decline in the share of adults who reported having attended one of several types of performing arts activities or who had visited an art museum or gallery. These bars represent the percentages of adults in any given survey year who said yes to the question whether they had attended, over a 12-month period, any one of the following kinds of arts performance. Classical music, jazz, opera, musical theater, non-musical theater, or ballet. They were counted if they did any of these things or if they had visited an art museum or gallery. By the way, uh, respondents are asked to exclude any elementary or high school performances they might have attended. These are the so-called benchmark arts because for a long time it was thought they could serve as a reliable, reasonable proxy for how Americans engage with the arts in general. In 2012, you see that the rate was actually larger or similar to that in uh, 2008, um, and this is part of the updated data we'll be releasing uh, with the report. Um, in other words, just over a third of U.S. adults did one of these activities, down from a high of 41% in 1992. But let's look at what happens when we add to the roster of all visual or performing arts activities we ask about. This bar represents the share of U.S. adults who said yes to having done any of the following, attend any of the activities I just mentioned, or attend an outdoor performing arts festival, a visual arts festival or craft fair, a live dance performance other than ballet, Latin, Spanish, or salsa music performances, or whether they toured or visited uh, parks, monuments, buildings, or neighborhoods for historic or design value. In addition, the survey asked people whether they had attended any type of music or theater performance not specifically mentioned. So enlarge the number of possible yes options, and you get a larger share of the public who report visual and or performing arts attendance, just over half. And this isn't a trivial difference. This is about a difference of about 45 million people who are now saying engaged in the arts, in arts attendance in some way that we hadn't captured through our previous method. Um, 
this is uh, also, I, I will just say that um, what I really find interesting, though, is that the SPPA also asks about a host of other non-attendance activities, whether people use electronic media, both new and old, to consume art of various types, whether they went to see a movie or a film festival, whether they read books or in, read books in different genres or of literature or books in general. And one of the things we did differently in the 2012 SPPA is to ask about people's use of electronic media to share art with others, either their own art or other people's, whether they posted it online or emailed it, for example. Um, I want to step back a moment and say that all these kinds of concerted changes to this SPPA instrument were really done with a lot of consultation with the field and with researchers and uh, really with a lot of thinkers within the arts and outside the arts. And so, so you know, there was some methodology based, based in our reasons to change the survey instrument, um, really in keeping and being responsive to the new ways that people are engaging with the arts and even ways that people have been engaging with the arts for a long time that the SPPA previously was unable to track. So I think we're getting a much more robust picture here. Um, we also enlarged the scope of activities in our questions about the kinds of art people created, practiced, or performed, either alone or with others. To this, we added questions about having edited or remixed different kinds of art performances or creations. What you see here is that arts attendance, even in the most non-prescriptive ways we could ask the question, gives us a rate that's almost in the middle of the range represented by all the different types of participation, called the modes of participation. And each of these numbers by themselves is far greater than the 35% we would otherwise use to track 2012 rates of arts engagement. This is the first year, partly due to our being able to double the sample size, as I mentioned earlier, that we were able to ask about such a broad slate of participatory arts activities. So for today, I'm going to focus mainly on our findings about trend data. Um, I'll do this for items one to three, shown here. With item number four, however, even though we don't have long-term trend data on this topic, because our questions about creating or performing art have changed quite a bit since 2002, I'd still like to share some notable conclusions. And for the sake of time, I'm going to have to skip findings about the use of electronic media to consume art, and also detailed uh, findings about demographic subgroups, which we look forward to sharing in the full report. Let's start with visual or performing arts attendance. So again, these numbers are going to be slightly different from what you see in uh, the report that you have from last year, the initial uh, estimates, the preliminary estimates. Um, what you're seeing, but the pattern's largely the same. What you're seeing here are two bars for each art form asked about. The top, or gray bar, represents the share of the total U.S. adult population who attended at least one of these kinds of performances in the 12-month period ending in 2002. The second bar, in orange, is the rate of arts attendance for adults in 2012. Here we're looking at some of the performing arts activities for which we have trend data available. Excluding elementary or high school performances, for example, you see that 12% um, of adults attended non-musical plays in 2002 compared with 9% in 2012. From 02 to 12, there was a drop similarly for classical music attendance and even for jazz. Musical plays at the top saw a small dip in 2012, but unlike the case with these other art forms, the decline did not also occur in 2008. In fact, as we noted last year, the attendance rate for stage musicals held constant from about 1992 to 2008. Now, for ballet and opera, it's worth noting that although you see uh, numerical declines here compared with 2002, the rates for each have stayed roughly the same since 2008. For dance forms other than ballet, uh, represented by the top twin bars, the rate change is not significant from 2002 to 2012. It's held at about 5 or 6 percent throughout. We now turn to attendance at a couple of types of visual art events, at least those for which we can make comparisons with O2 data. And we note again this drop off. As with the most, uh, one thing I want to just point out though that I, I neglected to mention on the previous slide, is from our early, from looking at the data and drilling down to the demographic subgroups, it seems that older adults are actually participating at higher rates than in the past. And this is uh, a silver lining, if you will, with these art forms, is that you're seeing a higher rate of older adult participation in both visual and performing arts based on the data we have. Uh, for decades, the survey, um, you know, we've, we've been following this information, and this is actually something that's kind of contrary to what we've seen in the past. For decades, the survey has asked about adult uh, rates of reading books not required for work or school, as well as reading in certain literary genres, novels or short stories, poetry and plays. Um, so uh, here are what the patterns look like. For voluntary reading of books, that is to say, reading for, uh, not required for work or school, uh, you, have the, you see that the rates have held roughly constant from 2002 to 2012. Uh, for fiction reading, 
um, there's a net kind of increase. Uh, it actually increased to about just above 50% in 2008. Now it's about 47% of all adults having read uh, a short novel or short story in the last 12 months. And poetry reading has lost about 42% of its 2002 share, now down to about 7% of all adults. Uh, play reading has also dipped uh, from a relatively low level to begin with, um, but it's not clear that that's a really important difference at this point. Um, what I just want to say here, though, is that, again, you see that older adults are, seem to be reading much more, a 65, to 70, 65 and up, actually, but also 75 and older, uh, reading more than those adults in the past. Um, and where possible, we'd like to draw on other data sources, almost as corroboration. Here we looked at the American Time Youth Survey, which documents how Americans ages 15 years and older spend an average day. What's striking here is not so much the directional shift over the years, but how the green line in these images is the highest. For the first image, you're looking at the share of Americans who read for personal interest on any given day over a series of years. The green line means that people in the 75 and older bracket over all the survey years were more likely to do this at all compared with 55 to 74 year olds. In the second image shown, you can see again that the green line is on the top showing the share of leisure time that adults 75 and over devote to reading. Taken with the SPPA data, it would be logical to conclude that these adults are actually increasing the chance that some of that reading will be literary. Uh, the SPPA questions about art, uh, learning in the arts have changed in some key respects, so we still are able to pull some trend data for certain items. But in general, this was one of the sections of the questionnaire we revamped so we could get more uh, specifically at arts learning inside versus outside school, as well as learning through other means than classes or lessons, such as learning through the internet being self-taught, or learning from family or friends. In this section, we also asked for the first time about how many adults who are parents brought their school-going go kids to a live performing arts event or took them to a museum. This number is about 43%, by the way. This in addition to whether their kids are receiving or have received an arts education. So the conventional storyline over recent years of the SPPA has been that the share of adults who report having taken an art class or lesson at any time in their lives, even as children, has greatly contracted. This was the subject of a monograph we commissioned a few years ago. So imagine our surprise when the 2012 SPPA revealed for the first time greater numbers of Americans recalling having had such education. Again, we're talking only about classes or lessons in a particular art subject. You can see that the increases occurred for the share of adults who reported taking a class or lesson in music, visual arts, or creative writing. This time, the bottom bars are longer than the top ones. Um, and again, when we dug into the data here, and this time I'm not going to say it's older adults who suddenly remember they had an arts education. It's actually, you see that younger adults, 18 to 24 year olds, those actually with better memories, I have, you know, presumably, of their high school education experience, important caveat, their high school education experience, are saying in their past, uh, in their, in their past lives they had, had access to arts education classes or lessons. So you see an increase, and we're, look, we're investigating that to see to what degree it drove up the overall rates. Um, but that's, that's, that's pretty telling, and it actually kind of goes counter, at least complicates the narrative um, that, you know, about a diminution in the offerings of arts education for certain kinds of art in the schools over the, over the past decade. Um, and this, this, this motif is kind of in keeping with Department of Education data, which in 2012 reported that contrary to what many thought, Arts education offerings, at least in visual arts and music, have remained at comparable, largely comparable levels over a 10-year period, while dance and drama offerings in schools seem to have declined precipitously. Now for the last section of the report to talk about before we move to regional findings is our questions about arts creation, performance, and sharing. As I said earlier, we don't have trend data here to go on to make comparisons with O2 numbers simply because the section was altered radically to include many different kinds of questions. Even after running the numbers and all the varied types of activities we asked about, the same, I guess, usual suspects turn up as commanding the greatest share of adults. Typically, needlework, quilting, sewing or crocheting, the fiber arts, with 14% of Americans doing that activity at least once in the past year. And photography for artistic purposes, or playing a musical instrument, with 12 or 13% uh, doing those activities. The proportion of adults who email, post, or otherwise share photography with others is considerably higher, 28%, while the share doing that with music, either their own or someone else's, is 22%. And yet, the clear standout in the greatest share of adults who do any kind of art making or sharing is social dance. 
As we reported last year, it, it involved 33% of all adults with Hispanics and young adults uh, among the most likely of all demographic subgroups. Uh, this finding came in for some light raillery in a PBS News Hour report. Actually, uh, the story was quite positive, but I didn't think the headline amusing. And I said, when I saw it, I said, that's exactly the kind of study, uh, kind of questions we, or conversation we want the study to provoke. But what the new report uncovers is a facet unique to arts creation through media. Um, for the first time, we were able to ask in the survey about the extent to which adults who created or performed art relied on electronic media to do so. And these are from our uh, looking at the data, and we're, we're still uh, investigating this further, but it looks like um, essentially um, Hispanics and African Americans both were more likely than whites or people of other races or ethnicities to have used media in creating or performing music. And in general, you're seeing a, a, a pattern where different racial or ethnic groups are actually more likely in some respects to create art through this media, through media, than others. And this is also true when you look at other uh, sociodemographic variables, you find that there are very different, um, there actually seems to be broader, more diversity reflected in the population of people engaging with media to create art um, than, than, than do when we don't ask the question about media as, as the way they're creating the art. Um, we can conclude, at least for now, that the, to the technology has been a great enabler of arts creation, at least for music and the visual arts. And as an aside, it's interesting that for music creation among Asian Americans, for example, uh, the rate of media use uh, for this purpose is relatively low. The SPPA, while being a large general population survey, yet does not allow us to probe too deeply into microgeographic areas. So I'm going to just present um, very few kind of preliminary findings on regional rates of arts participation. First of all, keep in mind that the regions to which I'm referring are those prescribed by the U.S. Census Bureau classifications. They do not align perfectly with, for example, the regions covered by regional arts organizations. In any case, the New England, Pacific, and Mountain areas showed among the highest rates of attendance in the so-called benchmark arts categories we discussed earlier. This has historically been the case, but when we take advantage of some of the new questions asked in the 2012 survey about the kinds of venues where people enjoyed visual arts or performing arts attendance, uh, the reasons diversify. We see that the South Atlantic region and West North Central, a region covering North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri, residents from these states were more likely to have attended a performance or exhibit at a church, synagogue, or other place of worship than were residents from elsewhere. Similarly, residents from East North Central, that's Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio, were more likely to have attended such events at elementary or high schools and in parks or outdoors than were most others. By the way, we also looked at metro or non-metro rates of arts participation in various categories and concluded that while metro area residents indeed is linked with higher rates of overall attendance, partly as a function of there being more institutional offerings of the visual or performing arts in those places, when we ask about attendance at craft fairs or visual arts festivals, you find that non-metro area residents attend such events at least as, at least at, as, as at, at least has high rates as, non -metro, as metro residents. Blah. They hold their own. What about art making? Uh, for knitting, weaving, sewing, needlework, and crocheting, these activities were most popular in the already mentioned West North Central, New England, and Mountain regions. But leatherwork, metalwork, and woodwork, these were the most popular in the West North Central and the East South Central, South Central, a region covering Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, and Mississippi. And in contrast with nearly every other form of arts participation measured, non-metro residents actually did these activities more than metro residents. This looks to be true for both fiber arts and leather, uh, metal, or woodwork. So what next? This is a photo by my colleague Ellen Grantham. Here you have a gathering of arts and cultural researchers, policymakers, and practitioners. Joan alluded to this just now. From the US, UK, Canada, Australia, and other countries. Uh, we convened earlier this month at the Gallup headquarters here in Washington for a two-day symposium titled Measuring Cultural Engagement Amid Confounding Variables, a Reality Check. Our goal was to revisit how various countries and cultural agencies prioritize survey items and what preparations we might take to ensure such data collections stay relevant or improve relevance in a changing survey environment. Not a little of the discussion centered on how we can extract the most meaningful information and what character of information for national funding and policy decisions about arts and cultural resources. 
Um, let me just tell you what led to this convening. The Arts and Humanities Research Council, or AHRC, one of seven research councils of the United Kingdom, embarked upon a couple of years ago what it calls the Cultural Value Project. A major part of that undertaking is to examine, quote, the cultural experience itself and its impact on individuals and its benefit to society. Now, this remit is uncannily similar to the one we set for ourselves at the NEA in the document How Art Works, copies of which uh, we have here today. That's our five-year research agenda, uh, which focuses on understanding the art's cognitive, emotional, and health-related effects on individuals on the one hand, and the art's social, civic, and economic effects on communities on the other. Given AHRC's own goal with the Cultural Value Project, each of our agencies saw natural fit for our two research units, and so we decided to hold this convening as the first step of what we hope will be more collaborations in the offing. Here's some products we have in the pipeline. Uh, first, we have to get this report out, of course. Um, then we will be posting also with it a new installment to our ongoing arts data profile series, which are intended as pain-free introductions to the general public, uh, for the general public, of arts-related data sets. Titled States of Engagement, Arts Participation by U.S. Geography, this one will focus on uh, selected state and metro rates of participation based on the 2012 SPPA. In a few months, we'll release a report analyzing potential reasons for and barriers to arts attendance using data from the 2012 General Social Survey, to which the NEA added questions to better understand those variables. Uh, the report will be accompanied by another arts data profile page, in this one examining whether there's a statistical tipping point in inducing people who have in expressed an interest in attending, but yet who have refrained from going to arts events, again based on the General Social Survey results. Uh, with reference to the photo I just showed you, the US-UK Research Symposium, we aim to produce a report of the proceedings with some conjecture on what might be plausible steps for refining na national data collection efforts with regard to participation and how to get the greatest public value from those endeavors. Lastly, in 2012, we embarked on conducting a short-form survey based on the SPPA to be administered annually in conjunction with the US Census Bureau's current population survey. We hope to have something to report next year on our first wave of questions about attendance and creation, represented in 2013 and 2014 surveys, respectively. I want to end on two slides that show you how these data are being used. Um, last year, we issued a challenge to the public to design apps featuring artful presentations and interactive capabilities with the SPPA raw data, which we made available around the same time as we released our first look report. Uh, in fact, you should know, as I mentioned earlier, all the raw data from prior SPPA years, as well as data documentation, are up on our website and housed at other data repositories. One of these apps, DataWorks, allows people to forecast how arts participation rates in given states will change when you introduce new levels of a given value into those states, greater education, employment, or even NEA funding, based on predictive modeling. The other app, This Art Life, allows you to enter your age and zip code and will pull from you using the census's SPPA data what art forms and types of participation are most popular in your area. Then it goes further and allows you to zoom in and see what cultural venues are in your vicinity. These, we believe, are only inklings of what will be possible to do with these data down the road. Lastly, here's an example of how these data potentially can become useful in policy situations. The President's budget for fiscal year 2015 includes a section on social indicators to provide contextual information for budgetary decisions. Last year, the White House Office of Management and Budget requested to use the SPPA data to create aggregate measures of participation for a new section on civic and cultural engagement. Um, the indicators they chose were percent who attended arts events, including movies, uh, and also uh, percent who did leisure reading, that is reading books or literature not required for work or school. Now, we may debate whether these are the right measures to be included for our monitoring the social and civic well-being of our country, but at least these markers recognize that data can be crucial to this conversation. Thank you, and I'd also like to thank Tamika Shingler for her help with this presentation, as well as other staff who've worked on the SPPA, uh, Neil Chittister uh, for the, his help with the presentation, Bonnie Nichols, Melissa Menzer, Ellen Grantham, and Stephen Schufelt. Thank you. Well, that was quite a bit. So uh, are there any questions or comments from the council for Sunil about his uh, report out here? Uh, just a, a quick question, Sunil, and thank you again for this fantastic information. And we may not be able to get into this type of detail, um, but looking at racial ethnic breakouts 
did you see any significant differential from the overall um, data as it relates to participation in classical music and or overall art education? So what we've seen uh, with, with classical music historically, and, and we're still confirming this, is it looks like um, that, that basically there hasn't been a decline, in a steep decline among non-white uh, groups, but uh, there hasn't been increases either. Um, and while you have seen white pop, the white population definitely decreasing, if you just look at race, ethnicity, uh, attendance as a measure. Um, you also see that, um, that actually uh, Asian Americans in this group that unfortunately is called other race ethnicities, uh, which includes but is largely comprised of Asian Americans, uh, that is um, actually doing fairly well, I suppose you could say. It's, it's, it's not declined from what we see initially, and we're, gonna, we're really confirming these numbers because you know, census continually updates things. Um, but that's what we're seeing with classical music. With uh, art education, um, it actually looks like the first time that we've seen this. Uh, if you had a, if you had a um, class or lesson in the last year, so forget the whole course of your lifetime, but just ask in the last year, and this is again an adult population, so this is my, what might be considered lifelong learning. Um, you actually see that there, there's more of a um, uh, kind of uh, reflecting more of what the general population looks like. In other words, it's much more uh, less not so many disparities in, in just the snapshot of a year. If you ask adults of any, you know, have you had an arts education of these types and you go through the list. And that's more of a formal classes or lessons too. And that's what's interesting. Um, but when you go through the lifetime, that's when you see the racial ethnic things pop out. And yes, it looks like big disparities with whites and non-whites. Uh, Deepa. Thanks, Emil. That was great. I, I wondered with the fact that we've had some discussion with international colleagues, if you could comment on how these data compare, especially on the benchmark arts, to what's happening in other countries, mainly Europe and Australia, it sounds like, that were represented. That's yeah. one question. The other is, have any of the other countries been measuring some of the new data and metrics that you've been, that you added into this survey for a longer period of time, or are they also just beginning to introduce those new metrics? Uh, so that's a great question. We, we actually, um, England, to take their example, has not incorporated creation and performance until recently. They're now looking at that. So that's new to them, in, from what I understand, from their surveys. Um, but they have been looking at other things, comparable you know, amount of time. And it's hard. One of the, we had a whole session devoted to the, the thorny problem, which you know, I hate to complicate issues, but it's a fact, it's very difficult to do these international cross-country comparisons and, ha and know you're talking about the same thing, even if you've asked the question in a similar way as you can because of the ways, different ways the surveys are conducted. Um, but that said, um, we, we, Canada doesn't seem to be showing anything for our neighbor to the north, does not seem to be showing any flagging like in, in, a, in a big way that's gotten people worried from what we gather uh, in terms of attendance, just to take that example, uh, which is again the most consistent, that's the consistently used measure in most of these countries, um, and, and certainly in Europe and in England, there hasn't been as much attention to declines in those areas. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, we'll have more information in the report that will come out. Um, and I think you'll see that um, the inspiration here is there's, there's definitely things we need to do in all these countries to not only stay current with the art forms and continually updating those while retaining trend data, but also uh, stay current with the survey world and the world of data collection at large, which you know about today. And how do you, uh, how can we merge household survey data with other kinds of data sets that all these countries are looking into this right now? Uh, last thing I'll say is England's doing, which I applaud them on, I guess, is they're doing a longitudinal sample of the surveys, which they'll be able to track the exact same people over time as to whether they did these things or not. And we've just inserted some questions into another questionnaire about older adults where uh, it's being done, uh, the health and retirement study, which also will have a longitudinal component. Great. Any other questions? Maria. Neil, thank you for this. I just wanted to know of the survey, does it include arts and cultural practice at home? And did you uh, also survey uh, folks in Native nations? American yeah, so the, the, um, so the rep, there definitely is representative of, of, of Native Americans. I'll have to go and see where they went geographically and if they got specific nations as a, you know, as a defining measure of getting at all Native American groups. Um, and I can find out that information. 
with but the Native Americans are reflected in the general population to the extent that they, I mean, the survey to the extent that they're re represented in the general population. So that's there. Um, with regard to home activities, there actually is a question about the venue in which people engaged in the attendance stuff. So we know where they went, and there's an other category which people are now saying we should probably build a home. We maybe in our next survey we'll put in a question about did you see, because you know there are more house, house performances and ho more kinds of events that are even staged at home, and the way you define whether you need to leave your place or go to someone else's home to engage with the arts is changing. I mean, that's something survey people need to catch up with. So we're probably going to ask that as one of the venue questions we ask in the future for attendance. But for the other activities, it's sort of irrespective of where you are. So a lot of the creating and performing activity, uh, we, you know, like for example, quilting or weaving or you know, even photography, filmmaking, we don't ask where you did that. Other questions? Other Maria? Just to, <laughs> just to comment, um, I, I just want to congratulate the, the Office of Research because having been as someone who's been tracking participation data and has done so for a couple of decades now, this is leaps and bounds mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. progress. Uh, and I know there's still work to be done to even more accurately reflect cultural life in the United States, but it's, it's a tremendous accomplishment, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. All right. Thank you, Sunil. Thank you. Thanks. So our next presentation will feature the M12 Collective, which is an artworks and an Our Town grantee. Wendy Clark, our Acting Director of Museums and Visual Arts, is here to introduce them. Wendy. Thanks, Joan. At its most basic, M12 is a collective of artists and creative professionals who work together to create interdisciplinary site-based artworks and programs in rural areas. However, it's not that M12 artists are bringing culture to a region. Rather, they are simply building upon and highlighting what is already there. Throughout the creative process, M12 artists work with local residents to explore community, identity, and values bringing both identity and values to life through sculpture, architecture, public art, and design. Here to tell us more about M12 are Kirsten Stoltz and Matthew Fluharty. Hi, thanks for uh, inviting us to, to talk about our organization and, and the work that we've been doing. Um, I'm Kirsten, and I run the programs for M12, and Matt Fluharty, who's here, uh, is a member of the collective, but also the director of Art of the, uh, Art of the Rural. Um, I wanted to, you know, just acknowledge the two grants that we've gotten from the endowment and, and the, the support and thanking, um, thanking the organization for believing in the projects that, that we do. Um, and, you know, supporting organizations that are proudly rooted in rural space and laying the foundation for decades of cultural pathfinders yet to come. Um, like Wendy said, uh, we are a group that is based in, on the High Plains in Colorado. Uh, we've been focused in Colorado for about five years, but the work has been ongoing for over 10 years, and recently we published a book that is just now coming out called A Decade of Country Hits um, that we're really proud of. Uh, inter it, we also interpret rural, rural space and ask more questions that more often yield further, um, further questions and yet um, thinking about more concrete findings through that. Uh, our focus is on context-based artwork, research, and education. Uh, everything is dialogical and collaborative in nature. Our practice often speaks to the value of, of underrepresented rural communities, their identities, and landscapes. Our organization philosophy is very holistic, and we fuse creative, uh, cultural, uh, in institutionality, and education. Um, let me forward some. 
slides here. Uh, and then, um, so Matt's going to talk a little bit about the changing dynamics of rural space and expand on on uh, the time, the context of our project. Hi there, it's wonderful to be with you all. Thanks for having us. Um, I thought maybe to begin this portion of thinking about the changing dynamics of uh, rural space, I'd offer a quote by Raymond Williams, who is a writer and a critic that um, some folks might be familiar with, uh, from a book he wrote called The Country and the City. He writes, it is significant that the common image of the country is now an image of the past, and the common image of the city is an image of the future that leaves, if we isolate them, an undefined present. And I'd like for a few minutes in my portion of our presentation uh, to dwell on a, a few of the frames that we think about uh, within M12 and within the larger sort of field of rural arts and culture um, and how, how we get at thinking about this question of the undefined present. Um, and we're especially honored to be in a room with many, many folks who have helped so much in, in this task of thinking about the undefined present, both in rural and in urban environments. Um, we, we believe that the process of working towards this challenge, if we're thinking about Raymond Williams' quote, is how do we get beyond the idea of the rural purely as, as, a, as a space that embodies pastness, as a pastoral, as an idyllic space, um, and we could think back here, uh, if we took Latin classes in high school or college, the word country comes from the Latin root contra. So it's always been a space that has been uh, juxtaposed uh, to um, urban modernity, more recently to urban modernity and certain forms of cultural experience. Um, you know, we, we see in that this sort of version of the rural, uh, we see it all across the media as sort of like the simple life. Uh, there's, there's nothing simple about you know, taking care of goats in the morning or uh, having to drive 40 minutes to work. Um, you know, the rural space becomes a repository in good ways, but sometimes often also in very problematic ways for all kinds of American values and, and the, the ways that, that that gets twisted around. Um, I think most importantly, if we're thinking about rural space and this idea of the contra, what comes up oftentimes is the notion that the rural is a periphery and urban space is in the center. And a lot of cultural and intellectual commerce happens along that continuum. So if we're in rural space, we're receiving um, information, messages, art uh, from an urban center. Um, this might be a point to uh, jump ahead here. Um, and I, I'd like to connect some of the things that are happening in real time in rural space to some of these aesthetic ideas. Um, so we have up here, we have, we have two slides of this ilk that are from the Carsey Institute at the University of New Hampshire. Folks can find their counties up here. The, uh, the gray counties are urban counties. Um, the, the colored counties are rural counties. Um, and so we see through, through this um, sort of population change map, I, I think one, imp one important way to kind of counter some of the work that were ideas about where we are and where we're working. Um, rural America is in a, a tremendous amount of change. It's a fluid moment for many rural spaces. Folks, as you can tell, sort of in the center of the country are moving. They're moving to other, other places. Um, but they're carrying with them their, their cultural history, their cultural experience. They're taking that knowledge into urban settings. And oftentimes, I mean, it must, we must say, taking it back, carrying urban experiences back to rural places. I mean, just for instance, Kirsten and I are, are both from fifth-generation farms. She lives in Denver. I live in St. Louis. Um, so we don't have a map for a term we like to use, the rural diaspora, but it's significant. Um, and I think it expands our sort of cultural sense of what's at stake in our artwork and the kind of art conversations that we have. Um, here is some sort of um, 20,000 miles above the land kind of landscape um, information about rural America. So it's roughly 80% of the geographic area, 20% of its population, um, depending on how you look at it, and there are many ways of looking at it, it could be much larger than that. Um, the difference between 53 and 2012 is interesting. For some of these notions about rural space, um, you can see between the two, um, population dipped a little, um, a little under 20%. Uh, but also, in terms of conceptions of rural space just as people living on farms, I mean, there's a very significant drop that happens there as well. So 19% of rural people in 2012 lived on farms, but 90% of that income came from off the farm. Um, you know, which, which is, you know, is a symptom of sort of consolidation of, of agricultural land in, in rural space in particular, which 
um, will, will maybe come up in some of the slides uh, in a little bit. Um, and these terms are so fluid. Um, as, as most folks know, the way the counties um, are, are deemed metropolitan or non-metropolitan is itself a 45-minute conversation. But when you look at it in, in certain sorts of ways, um, roughly 50% of rural people are counted within metropolitan counties. Um, so so the, the, the term is up for debate um, in, I think, really problematic ways. Or, uh, really productive ways as well. Um, here we have another Carsey uh, Institute slide about a distribution of people of color across rural America. Um, I don't know if it's big enough for folks to quite see what's happening here, but this has been, um, just for sake of time, I want to move to this one. Uh, one, one of the, the elements of this whole um, conversation about rural space that is tremendously exciting is that from the last, um, our last batch of census data, rural, rural population has, has slowed. Uh, from the 1990s to 2.2 million, but 83% of that growth is uh, people of color. Um, and, and, and what this, I think if we think about the Raymond Williams quote and this sort of um, unexamined vision of rural space, um, those cliches we have about rural space, um, they're, they're, they were never true, but they're certainly not true now, and it's changing at a very, uh, very fast clip. So in, in many ways, this is such an exciting moment for our work because all of these definitions are changing and there's a, an amazing sort of moment for inclusivity and diversity that's happening across rural America in so many ways. Um, so it's, it's no longer that idyllic space. So it's a great opportunity for us, but with that opportunity comes challenges. Uh, and this is sort of the great symbolic figure for folks in the rural arts, for folks working in any capacity uh, in rural space, which is the question of the support that rural communities and the folks who are working in rural communities receive. Um, I'll turn to the 1% in a moment here, but um, I'm not a demographer. Um, let me just, just say that. So there, there are others who are much, much more um, intelligent than myself on this matter, but um, investments in a rural economic development pale dramatically in comparison to what's happening in um, urban spaces. And much of the investment is individually based and not based in terms of uh, helping change the circumstances of rural place. Um, one of the great hopes for the rural arts and rural culture and rural development is philanthropy. Um, and this is where the um, symbolic figure of 1% comes up. Uh, in terms of philanthropic outlays, about 1% goes to rural America. Um, that's a difference of about three to $500 per capita in rural communities. Um, each year, that difference is $26 billion. Um, and I mention that because on one hand, that might seem peripheral to all of this work, but I think on another hand, you know, the terms that could be bandied about, you know, in, in terms of what M12 does, social practice, creative placemaking, all of those terms, those terms are inherently different in a rural context than they are in an urban one uh, be, because of some of these sort of structural and social architectural issues. Um, all of this could be overwhelming, but I think our, our mission and a lot of our collaborators uh, our mission you know, is to turn this in, into a point of opportunity. And that's really why, why we're so excited to be here, because one of the leaders in all of this has been the NEA and their sense, of, the amazing sense of, um, of equity that the R-Town program has and so many other NEA programs, not to mention um, the NEA's collaboration with Art Place, for which I think 31% of the projects just announced were from rural places, which is just so wonderful and heartening. Um, so while, while, while this could be overwhelming. What we're seeing in its place is that we, this is something rural people do really well, is we just get down to work. And in the place of maybe some, some kind of formal forms of support, we're creating learning communities, methods of exchange and collaboration that occur not only in rural places, but also in rural to urban places. Uh, and we'll see some beautiful slides of that uh, in a moment here. And I think in particular, thinking about how we all have rural stories is, is a frame that I think kind of unites a lot of a lot, of, a lot of M12's projects, and that we have an imperative to tell rural stories. I um, mean, you know, we have an imperative uh, to work with what is already in our communities, which Wendy, and Wendy said so, so eloquently a moment ago. And if the relationship between center and periphery is kind of challenged in this moment, and maybe some responsibility the center has left rural space, uh, with it has also gone a whole armory of aesthetic and cultural hierarchies. In that place, we can work together in new and exciting ways. Look at what's around us, and in the words of Samuel Mockby at the Royal Studio, uh, proceed and be bold, and to build real trust through the arts and culture in our rural communities.
Um, also, a, a lot of our work in M12 is, is based on making relationships, telling stories that can be equitable and that can be humble, but that can also transcend boundaries. And uh, this Campedo project, which, which worked to um, document the, um, the working conditions of uh, shepherds on the high plains, um, the population of which is largely from Central America, uh, was such, such an attempt. Uh, it was a design project. It was a project that dealt with civic engagement. Um, it informed all sorts of academic and design thinking. And it was local. It became regional. And elements of this work was in the uh, Venice Biennale in 2012. And then that cycles back into the local community in all sorts of ways. Um, and so it, it creates networks here, networks of folks with a common mission. Uh, this, is, this is from the, um, the big feed that happens um, once a year that the, the M12 puts together, uh, where, where we build a collaborative space between folks in rural and urban areas, artists and community members, folks who are in universities versus um, folks in the surrounding regions, people working across all sorts of disciplines and all sorts of walks of life. Um, a bison is roasted. Folks come together. There are presentations. Uh, you'll have uh, someone like Mimi Zeiger, who is a leading architecture writer. Then we'll have the, uh, the rodeo queens presenting their work. Then we'll have a yodeler. Um, and it's, not, it's natural. Uh, it's natural because it came from the place in a really profound way. And the ethic is essentially you're, you all are invited. Come on down. Uh, let's, let's, you know, let's build a community. Um, my portion of the time is almost up here, but um, what, what I, I would maybe just like to close with is that, oh, I don't want to jump ahead to Kirsten's work here. Um, some, many of our projects uh, bring folks out to buyers in the high plains with that spirit of equity and collaboration at the center, students, scholars, artists, cultural organizers, and they contribute and they meet people. And you know, if they're from urban areas and they've never quite crossed the line to engage with folks in the country, they now have a rural story, which I think is so important. And I think equally important, if they're from the country, they now have another powerful vision of what's possible in a rural space. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, so um, I'm going to speak specifically about uh, the projects that the NEA has, has supported. Um, and it's called Action on the Plains, Art in Rural Environments. We, the <clears throat> premise of, of the entire program is to really support experiential art making in, specifically to the Eastern High Plains. Guest artists are invited to collaborate with M12, conceptualizing and creating new works with the citizens. Um, of buyers and last chance, where where we uh, are making our, our studio, and we also have a really great plot of land that I will show you. Creative practitioners whose work is on the cutting edge of an ever expanding international dialogue surrounding art practices and in, in rural environments. We insist on all projects uh, being supported. Uh, support the importance of participation and uh, collectivity. Uh, this way, we we find that the working, the work that is produced sets a pace for a new for new forms of cultural expression in rural space. Uh, the this is a, a pretty typical image from from where we are. Most of the land is is used uh, to produce wheat and corn. Um, and then this is <clears throat> a really common image in, in any town, uh, rural town in Colorado, where most of the businesses are, are closing or um, actually just being abandoned because they're, the highway systems have, have kind of bypassed these small towns. Um, people breathe right through, uh, and so there's, there's a disconnect to the economic uh, support that could, could potentially happen. Uh, Jetson Arama is, a, is an artist that began uh, in the Navajo Nation. He's actually a really interesting story. He's a physician and started um, talking to people about family histories and the importance of those family histories. 
and seeing that these abandoned structures in small towns uh, it expanded that that dialogue about about the importance of who's there, who who can be there, um, the importance of family heritage. So we collaborated with one of uh, one of the local <clears throat> farm families from Byers, who uh, actually was really the family was instrumental in in um, founding the town. Uh, and then you'll see a picture of of Jetson Arama's um, work on the Navajo Nation. And it's really powerful um, imagery of wheat pastings. So. Uh, he decided to do some um, wheat pastings on farm architecture on Joe's land, uh, which is really beautiful because it's actually shown as as you drive on I-70, you can see the the wheat pastings on the farm. Um, so there's these really beautiful long shots, and people will get off the highway and and explore the town and actually go up and see the, the wheat pacing. So um, that wasn't the initial intent of the project, but it's a really great outcome. Um, another project is uh, with the town next to Byers, which is called Deer Trail. And we've collaborated with a group of FFA students over the past two years. Uh, Vopka Feenstra, who's the artist that we've collaborated with, is from Holland, and she her practice is very similar to ours, and she does a lot of community engagement, and she's uh, her interest lies in exchanging farm knowledge. So this was a perfect opportunity for for us to have a larger conversation about you know, these, the students within the, with this classroom, and how would, the, would knowledge be exchanged with Dutch students? So uh, it was interesting when we first started the project, the, we were in the classroom with the students, and we asked them who's going to take over the family farm, and no one raised their hands. And, you know, they, uh, I think there's a real sense of, of abandonment and that there's really nothing uh, to, to be done. And uh, as, I, as I talked to their parents, there was a real sense of sadness about that. So the project, this exchange, really um, was monumental. And here's uh, one of the outcomes is a documentary that's going to be happening. Is there sound? Welcome on my farm. This is the farm where I live. We are in uh, the Netherlands, in Friesland, and we have milk horses. It's just a little aspect of the farm. Welcome on my farm. This is the farm where I live. We are in uh, the Netherlands, in Friesland. Just a little aspect of the so this form. is the horse that I rope off of at like the rodeo, and I do the breakaway on him, and we're gonna go over there and we have a few calves and we'll practice. So this oh, is the horse a that good I one. rope off of at like the rodeos, and I do the breakaway. I beat the odd of you. And then we're gonna go over there and we have a few calves and we'll practice. The rest of this not working. Oh, there we go. Um, the result of that that film will be pretty incredible, and um, we're looking forward to showing it in both uh, Friesland, which is the rural uh, community that that we were in, and also in Deer Trail, and 
and buyers at our studio. Uh, Cultivator, this was a project called Graham's University, and it was an ex um, we collaborated with a group called Cultivator. Uh, they are also a collective and operate an organic farm in uh, Sweden. Uh, Graham's University is a cultural exchange uh, initiative that, that serves to build long-term dialogue about the importance of rural cultural connections and specifically addressing important global is issues such as environmental sustainability, global economies, existing economies, food production, and diversification. Our, our, one of our uh, collaborators was a, a five-generation farmer from uh, Last Chance. Her name is Rose Kronk. And we went out to her farm, and uh, a lot, a lot of really great stories come come out of these projects. And uh, we were sitting around and talking about, you know, what what the family did. And she happened to say, well, you know, there's this rhubarb plant, and she serves this rhubarb pie uh, during our visit. And she gave us this great story about uh, that. You know, 150 years ago, her family traveled from Pennsylvania with this plant. And this plant was, she's been cultivating this plant for, for years and years. And so it was this really amazing moment of sharing this um, really inspiring story about resilience and, um, you know, her family's heritage. So uh, a lot of conversations talk about, you know, food production. Um, importance of, of local historic societies, um, information about, um, you know, family heritage. And this is all, there's a generation gap that is happening from, um, from grandparents to now grandkids that are not interested in any of this information. So the project we designed was a mobile classroom unit because most towns are about 30 miles apart. And we set up classrooms and we just really had con had conversations about, you know, what are you thinking that is important to pass down to the next generation because of this gap that's, that's obviously um, really important to the community. Um, we did a billboard that was a, it's kind of a constant reminder of, you know, this is intergenerational knowledge, and you need to pass it on. These things are are important. Uh, we also went to the county fair and set up um, set up the classroom and had about 50 people share their information and share their knowledge, and uh, it was was really wonderful. This was uh, one of the outcomes of our collaboration was that we were invited to Sweden to uh, build a project with Cultivator. So we um, built this open air classroom, the you know put a tree through it because it, people would then sit on the tree and share information. And it was more uh, uh, about uh, thinking about the the farm, thinking about knowledge, sharing information. Um, this is a project by Lynn Hole, who's been making eco art for about 40 years. Uh, we were uh, there was a devastating fire through Last Chance, where where we have our land site, and there are 13 people that that now live in Last Chance, and um, three buildings were burnt down completely. And there's a, a birding site that is nationally recognized and uh, it, it got burned, and so there was a, what we did was we worked with the, the Lions Club in Last Chance and a birding organization based on the High Plains, and we uh, started to think about um, rehabilitating that site and clearing out debris, but also building uh, sculptural projects. This is a bat habitat. Um, this is on our land site in Last Chance. This is our, our neighbor who borrowed this truck from uh, the Rural Electric Association to help us rig the, <laughs> rig the sculpture. And mentioning, you know, this I called him that day 
to do this. In an urban area, this would never happen. You would have to schedule it and permit it and and do, you know, go through multiple um, departments. And it's a beautiful thing. He was willing to help. It, he called some people, and uh, it's, it comes back to that go-to attitude. This is um, another uh, bird sculpture, uh, birding um, sanctuary that is called the Raptor's Roost, and birds uh, fly and, and roost on, on the sculpture. It's quite beautiful. Uh, recently, we just recently, uh, in the last month, Matt Slaby, who's an internationally recognized documentary photographer, uh, has been going around photographing the abandoned missile sites in, in Colorado in our region and uh, he he also is is you know is doing a journal about the people that he meets the sites where they are what's going on in the sites and specifically the people that he meets and he he wrote in a sense it's almost the perfect place the high plains uh, to house a missile complex that held three nuclear missiles buried 16 stories underground. The location is unobtrusive, quiet, and out of the way. It's not exactly hidden, but you'd probably never uh, go there without a reason. Um, there's a, a lot of people that know about the history of the sites, and they go and um, explore that with Matt. Um, this is a quote by Fiona. Fiona Woods, and basically what what she's saying is that it's challenging this uh, this idea of you know agriculture is is now about not feeding us anymore, and so how can we uh, specifically shift that to something that a community member can um, can buy into? Um, is it's a larger conversation about land use um, and the land use in in last chance specifically we have partnered with uh, the local commissioners Washington County commissioners who uh, approached us and they said you know how can we help you do your project and we said well we'd really like to have a land site the town of last chance again is, is basically dying it used to be uh, bustling as uh, the intersection of two important highways and it had food, gas, and lodging and now there's there's really nothing. There's 13 people that live there and, and kind of keep it going. Our plot of land is 40 acres and we're starting a, a collaboration with a Dutch architecture firm and we're exploring the ideas of, of building structures on, on the landscape that people can come to and really engage with the landscape and also be inspired to make work, whether that be writing, uh, performance, visual arts, uh, science experiments. It's really an open space. We've done, we started um, with site characteristics and, and studying that. We also kind of have, you know, the dreams of Engaging the FFA program, having an, an animal pen, earthworks, trails, site observations, a multi multi use space. We uh, the closest town to Last Chance that has facilities is called Byers, and our studio is uh, located there. We're in uh, a 1903 building that used to be a, a Packard uh, car repair shop. And uh, most recently, it was the, a feed store, and we actually adopted that name, and it is still called the feed store. Um, but in it feeds imagination, and and uh, and so we this is kind of we call it the um, the UN in in uh, in buyers. Uh, we have a library, we have our studio, we also have a visiting artist program, and um, a lot of, you know, the community gathers there quite a bit. We host uh, talks, lectures, um, and community is always uh, invited to participate. 
Um, I wanted to kind of leave you with this quote uh, that we have in our library. Um, this place is a source of energy, a rite of passage, a place to reflect on our turbulent age, and a, lands and a landscape whose spaciousness and hidden springs encourage v viewers to imagine new ways of being. And it's really inspirational for us, and we continue to always have that in, in the back of our minds when we do our projects. So thank you. So our first question comes from Mas Masamoto, who's been following us online. <clears throat> so Mas says, as a farmer and an NEA council member, thanks for your work and a great presentation. Two questions. What can urban America learn from the art of the rural? The first question. And the second question is, when you're coming to rural California, specifically Fresno, and my farm, <laughs> Peach Farm. So, uh, what can uh, what can urban America learn from the art of the rural? Okay, maybe we can take art of the rural broadly to be or everything. Um, th thank you so much um, for this question. I, I think, I mean, there are, there are, there are a number number of echelons to it. I think most importantly. The point of exchange gives us a better cultural sense of who we are as Americans. Um, and I think you know, the arts are vehicles for consensus across all forms. And I think when all of us, whether we're in rural places or urban places, uh, begin, begin that dialogue, it only enlivens all of our civic spheres and our, our spir spiritual spheres and our artistic spheres as well. Um, you now, you know, I think beyond that, you know, then it's a question of um, just the kind of, the kind of engagement we saw, you know, finding, finding spots across the country where um, you can go and sit down with someone and see what they're doing uh, outside of the cities and you know, beginning this kind of process of dialogue that, that Kirsten's talked about. We have other uh, questions or comments from the council? Ms. Plumbing? So uh, we will uh, connect you with Mott so that you can... <laughs> you. <laughs> you should go soon though because he's harvesting his peaches right now. <laughs> We all want one of those speeches. Okay, thank you all very much. So our final presentation is about the new National Arts Policy Archives and Library, an initiative that Patrice Walker Powell helped to spearhead. So here to introduce the presentation is who else but Patrice. Patrice. Thank you. Um, I'll begin by saying that this project began about nine years ago when we had a financial dilemma. We needed to let go of some real estate in our old building, the old post office building. And the uh, real estate happened to be our library. And I kind of went apoplectic uh, as directors were asked to come down and to look at what was there and perhaps take things back for safekeeping. So now I'll go to my formal notes. As Joan mentioned, this is a project that I'm personally very excited about. For your information, this project took the cooperation of a lot of people. Our attorneys, our research department headed by Sunil, and many other offices throughout the agency. Um, the National Arts Policy Archives and Library officially launched last September after many years of planning and preparation. This is a joint collaboration between the NEA and the U UMass Library. Um, the project has assembled key archival materials including the NEA's documents. Once all of the contributions into this collection have been digitized, the full collections will be available to students and researchers free of charge. Right now, the NEA is the primary uh, um, contributor to the library. Joining us today from the UMass Amherst is Rob Cox, the head of special collections and university archives at the university. Rob has been instrumental in making this project happen. 
Thank you. Along with several other people. A former paleontologist and molecular biologist, Rob also has graduate degrees in geology, poetry, archival studies, and history, and has studied and written about subjects that range from food in New England to the history of sleep. How he has the energy to do all of this and then come to Washington, I don't know. But welcome, Rob. It's all very confusing, I'm sure. Uh, well, I really thank Patrice uh, not only for setting this up nine years ago, but for inviting me to talk to you all about it, because I think we do need help in this. And this is an endeavor that has to be mutual, has to involve a lot of people. And I'm really glad in particular to be following Sunil and M12, because I think the themes that they outline in their talks are themes that I want to highlight here. Sunil has talked earlier today about the importance of documenting who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, who's responding to it. M12, the way I read it, is looking very closely at the importance of arts in building community. It's resonance with the past, but looking toward a future, imagining a future, in fact. And that's what archives do, in, in essence. Not me, but archives. And I'd like to suggest that what we're trying to do with the National Arts Policy Archive and Library is to build on those themes of documenting who we were and what we were, to think about our past as it relates to the future. Now, we did this event last October where we kicked off, announced formally that the National Arts Policy Archive and Library was a thing and is building. And we've been building toward that in the past year based on the previous eight years of work prior to that because it is a very large task to sit back and say that what we're going to try to do is archive the history of arts administration. I think when Patrice first started thinking about this, she recognized that this is not a field that has been professionalized for all that long, 50 years, maybe 60 but we're not dealing with a field that has a very, very long history. But we are at a moment in history when we're looking back over that period of professional activity. And we are still at a stage where we can begin to capture the pioneers of that field because many, but not all, are still around. Many of the organizations that came into being in the 60s and the 70s are still around and still active. And many of those have not done a superb job, I would say, of preserving their own history and showing who they are. The difficulty here is that we can't simply rely on the federal government to document even the NEA because arts administration from the beginning has been a combination of a public and private partnership. It's been personal, it's been professional, it's been political. It could be more alliterative if it wasn't the morning and if it really wasn't a Friday, but you get the point that we're talking about something that is very large, amorphous, dynamic, and shifting. Now, UMass comes in because our archive has a particular portfolio, a particular way of thinking about who we are and what we do. One of the central focal points of what we do as an archive and who we are as an archive is that we attempt to the best of our ability to document the history and experience of social change in America. We're the home of the papers of W.E.B. Du Bois here, and I like to think in particular that we build on a Du Boisian ethos of sorts. For me, what characterizes Du Bois, among other things, is that he had this remarkably broad, synthetic vision of the interconnectedness of social, cultural, and political assets of life, all in the pursuit of social justice. Du Bois recognized that you couldn't separate social activity, cultural activity from political activity, and that if you're going to advance the cause of the race, of the nation, of equity in society, you need to think equally broadly. You need to spread out your labors into as many avenues of production as you possibly can. And our collections reflect that interconnectedness that Du Bois sees. Uh, we start up in the upper right with, with people who live alternative lifestyles, civil rights movement, the peace movement. All of these are interrelated with 
organic agriculture, sustainability, alternative energy, anti-nuclear movements, many, many other things that show up in dozens and dozens of our collections, even people who wear very nice suits up in the upper left. I can give you his name and address if you'd prefer. But Du Bois himself recognized that the arts were at the heart of what we're talking about here. Du Bois is a great writer and a great analyst, a great sociologist. I don't read sociology. I'm a historian. Du Bois was a great producer of cultural information. You may know that he was, in addition to being a historian and a sociologist, he was also a novelist, a playwright, and a poet. He was one of the sparks who helped animate the Harlem Renaissance. Du Bois recognized that the arts were the intellectual context, the organizing principle, in some sense, for social change. They're a uniquely effective mechanism, a vehicle for transmitting cultural and political, sorry, political information and political change. But they are also a great way of expressing the, the unique cultures that are represented in America. So Du Bois saw arts as central to his overall mission of building social equity and social justice. Now, archivists, our feet are very much in the dirt. We're usually somewhere in the basement, a dank and dark corner. We're not up there in the high-flying Du Bois world very often. What we do is reach out to people like you, organizations like the ones that you belong to, organizations and movements like you've been involved in, to try to cull the material products of what you do in your day-to-day -day work. Provide that documentation that Sunil documents statistically. We try to document it with the textual record, the visual record, the auditory record of who, who you are and what you do. The letters, the photographs, the minutes of meetings, the publications. And what do we do with that? Well, folks will often think of an archive as being a dark and dingy corner of the basement. But in fact, our central goal in bringing this material together is to put it out there for the public to see. Every collection that comes in to special collections at UMass goes up into our online catalog, and this is the new one. I've circled three little areas there because what we do is provide multiple avenues to exploring this textual, visual, sorry, textual, visual, and auditory record of our past, of our achievements, of what we've done. I won't go into all the details because it's mind-numbingly boring even for an archivist, but you should understand that if you were to search through our catalog, if you were to go through Google, if you were to go through any other of the possible means that modern researchers go through, and they're almost all intermediated by the Internet, by electronic means, you would come to, ultimately, this description. This is one place you might come of the, the NEA records that have come to us up to this point. We received several boxes, I don't know how many, but many boxes of NEA publications. And we've gone through in the last few months and digitized all of them. We present this contextual description of who the NEA is and what this collection is, and we'll do this for every participant in the National Archive, sorry, National Arts Policy Archive and Library. There is a detailed inventory here, and this is an inventory. I don't have my glasses on, but I'm, I'm pretty confident. This is an inventory of those publications, and each one of these has been digitized and is fully available, freely available, 24 hours a day. I should say also, this is just an opportunity to hawk our own little shop here, but we have just completed digitization of the entire papers of W.B. Du Bois and Horace Mann Bond, Julian Bond's father, who was a great educator and civil rights activists as well. And all of these are housed together in our digital repository here. This is Du Bois, his wife Nina, and, and uh, son Berge, who, who died young and tragically. But all of these things, the NEA archives, Du Bois bond, are all available online in our digital repository, as well as in that catalog that you sell, as well as in the Internet Archive, as well as one after another after another electronic resource. The object is that we can take the record of what you have done as administrators, as artists, as activists, put it into a form that anyone, anywhere, at any time can get access to, 
and make it maximally available so that any organization anywhere looking to imagine that future that M12 are trying to imagine, or who are working in a dank basement somewhere in Iowa, because Iowa seems like the end of the world to me. No offense. Anyone can get access to this. Anyone can see what we've done in the past. Anyone can imagine that past so that we can begin to look toward our future. Uh, the 50th anniversary of the NEA is coming up next year. And it is a particularly important time then to sit, step back and to look at the history of arts administration, which is basically coextensive with the NEA. And to ask, what have we done? What has succeeded? Where are we going? And I'm hoping that NAPAL, the National Arts Policy Archive and Library, will play a role in helping that and getting the word out in great detail so that we can all learn from it. Because archives are not about the past. They're about the future. And they're about how we use the past to create a new community and a new future before us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert. And so we're very excited about the project and asking, are there any questions from the council? on this archive project. There's some. OK. Very good. Thanks. So um, thank you, Robert. So now Jane Chu, Chairman Chu, will take us through our final piece of business. Thank you, Joan. Well, I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed their applications and guidelines presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveals that all recommendations for funding and rejecting have passed. Are there any additional comments, questions, discussion from the council members? I would like to thank the entire NEA team, the staff, for all of your hard work that went into preparing for this council meeting, and again, I look forward to working with you. Now, the 182nd meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned, and we'll see you in October.